This video is a continuation of an analysis series for the webcomic Homestuck. I wouldn't necessarily say that anything from part 1 is required to understand what I'm going to say here, but I'm still going to be working under the assumption that you've watched it. I'm also going to be working under the assumption that you've read the comic. Consider this your one and only spoiler warning. There will be times in this video where I will give away a character's entire arc in a single sentence. If you're someone who found this series because you're wondering whether or not you should read Homestuck, I'd again recommend watching part one of the series, and then stopping there if you're sold on reading it. That one is designed to be friendly to newcomers, whereas this one, and all the ones following it, are very much not. I said in the last video that part two of this series would analyze the video game mechanics and tropes present in Homestuck. Turns out that was a bit of a lie. Homestuck uses ideas and tropes from video games in some extremely creative and innovative ways, don't get me wrong, but the most admirable uses of these things would be those that transcend being simply references or aesthetic touches and instead become essential to the presentation of Homestuck's overall themes and messages. Because of that, to simply list all of them out of context wouldn't do the topic much justice. Instead, I'm going to disperse this discussion throughout the other videos in the series, as well as maybe making some smaller videos as I think of topics. Homestuck is a story about agency and the power of thought, and a key part of how those themes present themselves is through the aspect system. In this video, we'll be diving into that. So with these two overly verbose disclaimers out of the way, let's get started. We speculated in part 1 that the furthest ring gets its name due to it being the farthest layer of abstraction that the characters and readers are supposed to be able to understand. But Paradox Space is still made out of something. When traveling the furthest ring, Calliope tells Jade that all of the aspects are closely woven together here, creating the canvas that they exist on. When Jade replies that she doesn't see any of them, Calliope responds with this. One doesn't see abstractions, not directly. So what did she mean by this? If you just watched my last video and you're eager to recontextualize Homestuck in terms of computer science, then understanding what Callie meant by this isn't actually that difficult. If we choose to view paradox space as an operating system, then we could say that Kali is just referring to the next layer of abstraction out from that, which would be the assembly level. To clarify, the operating system is a program like any other. It's programmed in a language like C++ using basic structures like loops, if-then statements, different kinds of variables, classes, methods, and so forth. You tend to think of these as the most basic building blocks of the program, and at least conceptually speaking, they are. But when you run a program on your computer, that code you wrote gets decomposed into even simpler commands. These commands are the ones built into the circuitry of your processor, and the collection of them is called the instruction set. The language used to program with these is called assembly language, and it's notoriously unintuitive to work with. In the computer science interpretation of Homestuck's setting, I would say that this instruction set is what the aspects are referring to. They're the real basic building blocks used to make the building blocks that humans actually work with. One doesn't see the aspects directly because from the standpoint of human thought, one is working with objects made out of them. And that's all well and good, but at the end of the day, all we've done so far is talked about Homestuck's setting. And while the computer science and biology inspirations for Homestuck's setting are a clever reflection of the story's core themes and messages, it's time for us to turn away from the story's inspirations and take a look at what those inspirations are actually working towards accomplishing. I think it's going to be more productive to veer away from computer science for a while, and try to understand Calliope's remark a little more generally. To that end, let's turn towards some Greek philosophy. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, several men are imprisoned in a dark cave, and have been for as long as they can remember. They're chained to a chest-high wall with a fire on the other side, and their heads are forced by metal hooks to keep them looking forward at all times at the wall opposite the side of the room which has the fire. As activity goes on behind them, the fire casts a silhouette of what's going on onto the wall, and the prisoners see this rather than what's actually happening. This goes on for so long that eventually they forget what the real world looked like, and the shadows on the walls take its place as what's real to them. If something resembling a horse were to walk behind them and they see its silhouette on the wall, that silhouette is the horse to them. The idea that there's a truer form of a horse never even occurs to them. So what would happen if one of them was allowed to actually turn around and see the real horse? Which would be more real to him? Whatever the answer is, this points out an interesting question to us. How do we know that our horse is the real horse? Is what we see as a horse the true form of a horse? How could it be? I could find you two animals that are both definitely horses, and yet you could still point out differences between them to me. Why is that? One might say that it's because there exists in my head a set of ideas and qualities which define a horse, and when I see something that meets that criteria for the ideal horse in my head, I simply call it one. You might even call this thing in my head a blueprint for a horse. 
You might even call it a class. Now consider this. How do I know if my definition of horse is the same as yours? I don't, and you don't either. So what does this mean? Is there no such thing as a horse? Well, you could think that if you really wanted to, but you'd probably find yourself going crazy after a while. Or you could take a cue from Plato and agree that there exists on some plane of reality the single true idea of a horse, a fundamental horse form from which all other horses are derived, and the definitions of horses that you and I have in our heads are simply crude imitations of the true horse form. You might find yourself asking, who decides what this true form is? Is there some supreme being somewhere that decides it for everyone? This is an excellent question, but for now we're going to leave it on the back burner and come back to it in another video. This idea that there is some higher plane of reality in which there exist true universal blueprints for all the things we experience is called the theory of forms, and it's part of a more general theory of reality known as platonic realism. To quote Wikipedia, Platonic realism states that the visible world of particular things is a shifting exhibition, like shadows cast on the wall by the activities of their corresponding universal forms or ideas. This probably isn't as new a concept to you as you might think. For example, whenever you're using mathematics, you're drawing directly from this plane of reality. Just as there exists a single universal horse form, there also exists the form of, say, a perfect circle. But in reality, there are no perfect circles. As Caliborn puts it so eloquently, what most gifted artisans will tell you is that circles are basically fucking impossible to draw. Trust me, it's like a paradox, a shape without angles. What? But this doesn't stop Caliborn from thinking about circles anyway and creating a pretty decent approximation of one. Even though nobody has ever seen a perfect circle, it still takes no time at all to imagine one and design real things based on them. Who's to say that the thing we made is any more real than the idea we made it from? For that matter, Who's to say the converse? But now we can make things get really weird. How do I construct a circle in my head? Is a circle the most basic idea there is? Or is it the composite of smaller ideas? Just how many forms are there? What kind of questions am I even asking? Am I ever going to get to the goddamn part where I talk about Homestuck? When will I stop asking questions and actually continue saying things and- Let's shift gears a bit. Since the beginning of time, humans have attempted to create their own order from chaos, and in doing so have developed philosophies which apply structure to the world around them and help them to understand it better. Most of these philosophies are reductionist in nature. That is, they designate a few specific things as irreducibles, and then they take the objects in reality and attempt to break them down in terms of those specific things. Then, by knowing only facts about those irreducibles, one can describe how those constituent parts interact and combine to make the whole that's being evaluated and hopefully understand the object better as a result. Aristotle of ancient Greece, for example, broke reality down into five distinct objects he called elements. Those elements were earth, fire, water, air, and aether, with the logic being that the first four break things down into what are typically referred to now as the four states of matter, and the fifth term being a heavenly substance that's created in the stars. Modern fantasy tends to employ magic systems which are variants on Aristotle's system, while in science fiction in the modern world, our system breaks down reality into elements of our own, the periodic table. Homestuck has a reductionist system too, but Homestuck's reductionist system is the most interesting I've ever read about, because instead of breaking down our reality, it breaks down platonic forms. To begin to get an understanding of this, let's look at a conversation that Rose has with Dave in Act 6. Here she tries to explain why creating apple juice for Dave was so much harder than it sounds. Apples are startlingly difficult to reproduce. We take for granted our ability to take idealized instances of even quite complicated objects and conjure them from the void. But complexity implies a heavily combinative nature, so many things are synthesized from a series of much simpler ideas. To those entities capable of conceptualization and abstraction, an apple is as close to being a notionally irreducible object as it gets. Tell me, Hotshot. What ideas would you combine to make an apple? Uh, exactly. Thus is why apples are such indivisible symbols when it comes to the field of ideas and their reductionist essence from the perspective of humans in particular. Both from a standpoint of cultural and mythological significance, and from a practical one as well, if you happen to find yourself actually trying to produce one. In the furthest ring, platonic forms are real. They are the base classes that paradox space builds reality out of. Whereas modern physics breaks down reality into the physically irreducible, Homestuck breaks down reality into what Rose calls the notionally irreducible. And just as fundamental particles are to the periodic table of elements, aspects are to this system's irreducible forms. 
Twelve aspects are the basic building blocks of thought, and where we in our universe might make a distinction between thought and reality, Paradox Space doesn't seem very concerned. As we'll see, Homestuck wants to convince us that our thoughts create the world around us, and the aspect system is just another way to work towards that goal. The aspects are, in no particular order, breath, light, time, space, void, heart, hope, life, blood, doom, rage, and mind. If some of these sound abstract to you, that's because they are. Remember what I'm claiming these things actually are, after all. The idea that something like rage is a quantifiable building block of reality is a pretty novel concept, and in any more conventional fantasy or science fiction story it would probably be pretty hard to explain to the reader. But in an extremely unconventional use of RPG character classes, Homestuck manages to make this look easy. The idea of a class is one of the oldest and most universally understood tropes in games, both video and tabletop. The class doesn't by itself dictate what your character is able to do, it more dictates where you're allowed to go. Two wizards might have the same set of opportunities, but one wizard can choose to specialize in lightning, and the other can specialize in fire. What makes class systems popular, especially in multiplayer games, is that they naturally specialize everyone playing it. It makes everyone feel like an important member of the team, since it ensures that they'll all have unique skills giving them a role to play that others can't fill. It's worth noting that in most RPGs, a character class will only describe what kind of toolkit they have. It says nothing about the path that the character will take and has no bearing on the story that will unfold around them. Before you start typing a disagreement, I'm speaking strictly in terms of mechanics here. If you decide to roleplay a warrior in a specific way, that's your choice, and you could play a wizard and act the same way if you wanted to. Let's contrast this with the titles that the hero of a Zelda game is assigned. In every Zelda game, the player character is a prophesized hero of something. In the N64 games, Link is the hero of time. In The Wind Waker, he's the hero of wind. In some sense, this title is like a class because it describes the tools he'll use and the magic he'll harness to achieve his goals. But in another sense, it isn't a class, because not only do players not choose it for themselves, there's only one title, meaning everything in the game is available to the player regardless. This works because Zelda is a single-player game. The player doesn't need choices and specializations to feel like they have an important role in the story because they are by default the most important person in it. The idea here is similar to a multiplayer RPG, but it's being used for a completely different effect. It's less of a specialization and more of a prophecy. It has no bearing on any quality of the game's mechanics, but instead is being used as a tool for the narrative. And it works. There's a reason that cryptic prophecies are so widely used in storytelling. They foreshadow the rest of the story without giving it away, and they give the reader slash viewer slash player a framework from which they can continuously place the story that's unfolding into perspective. In a Zelda game, it's even more effective because it is framing the player's own actions, making them feel like they're a part of something bigger than themselves. In addition, it can be interpreted by the player as a challenge to them personally, so that in overcoming the challenge presented to them, they feel a sense of personal satisfaction at living up to the role. It's one of many, many qualities which makes Zelda games feel epic and timeless. Homestuck, being a traditional narrative which involves a multiplayer game, is able to take the best qualities of both the class system in an RPG and the titles in a Zelda game and use those to create its class and aspect system. Characters playing the game are seemingly assigned a title just like in Zelda. In fact, they sound identical to Zelda. One might find themselves referred to as the Hero of Doom or a Hero of Void. Like a Zelda game, these describe the tools that the player will use to live up to their prophesized roles, except the tools in this sense are aspects. And by assigning each character to be a hero of one particular aspect, the story is able to show us each one in an isolated setting. This solves the problem of how to teach us what the aspects describe. We can know exactly when something that is happening should be interpreted as a ragey thing or a mindy thing, despite those things being extremely abstract in principle. And by having this for each individual player, it also makes the whole story feel like a big puzzle. Readers will find themselves wondering what kind of contribution a new character will have to the story based on their title, and this is great because this means that they're thinking critically about the aspect system all the time. And to reinforce the notion that everybody has an important job to do, Homestuck implements a class system on top of this. Rather than just being called the Hero of Doom, they'll instead be called the Knight of Doom, or the Prince of Doom, or the Bard of Doom. The character's class gives us further hints into their role in the story, and dictates how that character will wield and weaponize their aspect. With the introduction of a class system, we're able to see each aspect from multiple angles. We can see what the mind aspect looks like when used by a thief, and then look at it when used by a mage, and from that get a better idea of what mind is by itself, and eventually how all of them together make up a reductionist system for platonic realism. 
This is extremely clever. It borrows these two ideas and merges them to not only naturally benefit the story in all the ways that they benefit their respective video games, but at the same time use them as tools to efficiently help the reader understand its own ideas. Now it's finally time to see all of this in action. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the story arcs of various characters and see how they show us what kinds of ideas each aspect describes. We'll start with Breath. Breath most literally describes the wind, but it also describes motion, freedom, inspiration, and clarity. John is the heir of Breath. Heir probably translates to one who inherits, so on some level John can be thought of as someone who will gain command of the wind, which is exactly what we see happen. Before getting directly in touch with his powers, we see John bailed out of multiple bad situations by the wind serendipitously, as if the wind was protecting him, watching over as a guardian while waiting for him to mature and pick up the torch. Rose mentions that an heir's personal quest will be one of maturity, and it seems like John's powers develop in direct correspondence with his progress in that department. As he matures, he gains command over the breeze and becomes the Wind Waker. It's him. But this isn't nearly the end of John's development as an heir. An heir is typically next in line to become something, and in that sense, John's title might be better read as one who is next in line to be breath. It seems like one can interpret the role of an heir as someone who becomes a symbolic or physical embodiment of their aspect. This happens too when John later learns how to literally become the Breeze, dematerializing and then rematerializing wherever the Breeze takes him. As I said, I think that breath can be associated with the idea of freedom. John later becomes the embodiment of this too when he dislodges himself from the narrative and gains the freedom to move around canon space as he pleases, becoming a symbol of agency for the entire story. John's very personality reflects breath as an idea. He's blissful and carefree, his mind freely and easily flowing wherever it's pushed or wherever it feels like going. He's easily swayed wherever the plot takes him, never voicing any resistance. He's happy to do whatever anyone wants of him as long as it isn't against the best interests of himself or his friends, while at the same time is nearly impossible to force into doing anything that isn't. Sound like the wind to you? It does to me. In another demonstration of the aspect, Tavros, the Page of Breath, is shown to repeatedly inspire armies to follow him. When Vriska accuses him of using his powers to mind control monsters into helping him with his personal quest, Tavros is quick to clarify that he's not forcing them to do anything and only placing friendly suggestions in their minds. According to him, they're free to do as they want and are helping because they want to. In other words, Tavros is only acting as the wind behind their backs, giving them a direction to act in. He later proves to Vriska that he was telling the truth about this by inspiring an enormous army of ghosts to fight with him, beings which even if his powers were manipulative in nature wouldn't be usable on. John too is shown to be a source of inspiration to those around him. The three birthday presents that John sends to each of his friends have a huge influence on how they see themselves as people, end up defining many of their hobbies and interests, and even retroactively become responsible for their friendship in the first place. This is where John's leadership abilities come from. His simple outlook on life give his friends a clear direction to go in where they might otherwise question themselves. It's fitting that one who inherits the idea of motion would be the main character. As the protagonist, John is the one who sets the pace of things, and is the chief agent of motion in the story from a metafictional standpoint. In addition to all of this, one could even interpret John's role as the heir of breath as being an agent of clarity. John's personal quest involves unclogging all the pipes all over his planet and allowing them to carry the breeze freely. It's also fitting that John would be the one to initiate his session Scratch, since this is essentially him clearing his game save data. In another act of clearing things up, he's shown to be able to use his powers to clean up the glitch artifacting which plagues the narrative after Caliborn dirties the cartridge running the story. A little later, John plays the wind and clears out all the pipes, completing his personal quest, and in doing so creates gusts which are so powerful that they air out the cartridge and allow it to run properly. Let me just reiterate, as the air of breath, John literally blows on the cartridge running Homestuck to save the plot. My point with all this is that John is the air of breath given any interpretation of the title. If you want to think of breath as simply the idea of wind, you can. John levels up, makes tornadoes, lifts himself up with wind, and saves the day with the wind's help. But if you want to think of breath more symbolically, you can also do that, and as we see, we're able to take multiple more specific ideas and look at them as expressions of breath. We can even do this in the most literal way possible. Both Tavros as well as his ancestor Rufio feature character arcs whose conflicts center heavily around freedom of motion and the ability to fly. The only other thing we really learn about Rufio's role in the story is that he was very popular. Rufio was the rogue of breath, everyone wanted to talk to him, and in that way he was literally stealing the breath out of people. I want you to take two things away from all this. The first is that breath is portrayed as a fundamental idea in that you can build other ideas out of it. Freedom as an idea is a platonic form, which is an expression of breath, as is motion, wind, breathing, and clarity. These things are constructed out of breath. 
Second, note how essential having a video game style RPG class system is in showing us this. In a typical fantasy series, you could feature wizard characters who learn different ways to channel the breeze, but that would only show Breath as a physical constituent of the fantasy world, i.e. just another whimsical interpretation of the scientific method. John shows us things about Breath without actually using the aspect at all. We can learn things about it by simply watching John develop as a character, and then form interpretations of the aspect by connecting those developments to his title. By interpreting Breath symbolically in all these different ways, we're seeing Breath not just in terms of a reductionist science, but also as the building block of all the ideas, all the platonic forms, associated with the Breath aspect. Let's next take a look at the light aspect. Light at first glance is slightly more abstract than Breath. It's common enough to have wind as an element in fantasy stories, but light, just light by itself, not lightning or fire, just light, is slightly less so. First and foremost, light does relate to actual photons and light rays, which we see confirmed in Collide when Rose is shown shooting them out of her quills. It's also shown that every light player has some kind of advanced vision and can manipulate light rays to see through opaque objects. Light likely also corresponds to fire and lightning on more offensive classes if the sun which symbolizes it is any indication. However, just like Breath, Light describes much more than just these. Light also describes the ideas of fortune, free will, self-worth, and relevance. To start with fortune, when I say that word, I'm referring to both its definitions. That is, fortune as in riches, as well as fortune as in chance or luck as some external arbitrary force which affects our affairs. Players that can manipulate Light are able to manipulate their futures and lead themselves or their friends to fortuitous outcomes, and lead their enemies to equally unfortuitous outcomes. Friska is the thief of light, and she brings herself good fortune by stealing it from others. She can take all of the luck that an enemy has and use it for herself, manipulating any chance-based outcome into being in her favor, while at the same time rendering the victim distinctly unlucky. She uses this to full effect with her weapon of choice, a collection of 8d8 dice which have different effects associated with every combination. By stealing an enemy's luck from them, she can roll her dice and know that fortune will smile on its outcome. The other definition of fortune applies to Friska as well. We see her steal and hoard plenty of this too as a pirate. Light is also descriptive on a metafictional level. Just as breath seemed to describe plot movement and pacing, light players tend to find themselves as the center of the narrative's focus. Friska's title is a play on words in this sense as well. From the very first page she appears on, she steals the spotlight, and her entire personality seems almost built for doing so. She's obsessed with being the center of attention, and she goes to great lengths to not only be responsible for every good or bad thing that ever happens, but also to make sure people know that she was responsible. Upon first contact with the humans, Vriska immediately does everything she can to make herself responsible for as many major events in their session as possible, both good and bad. She makes herself responsible for the creation of their first guardian, Jack's ascension, Beck's prototyping, Jade's narcolepsy, and even helps John ascend to the god tiers just so she can take the credit for it. Oh, and the same goes for you too. Vriska wants you to know she's important. All three of the light players seem somewhat aware that they're characters in a story, and Vriska takes her relevance in said story very seriously. She wants you to know that she's the most important troll, by miles. She wants you to talk about her on forums, and to argue extensively about all the things she does. This meta-interpretation of her title is taken to some ridiculous extremes later on. Even after her character arc supposedly ends with her permanent and thematically appropriate death, she still somehow manages to claw her way back into relevance as a ghost. During this time, we eventually see the author of the story fall in love with her, going so far as to propose to her within the comic, offering her a ring which would magically bring her back to life in the most contrived way imaginable. Even after rejecting Husey's proposal and earning his disdain to the point where he actively tries to blot her out of the comic, by the end Vriska nonetheless manages to find herself retconned back to life where she resumes being one of the most important characters for the rest of the story. If that's not fulfilling the mythological role of a thief of light, then I don't know what is. Achieving favorable outcomes is equal parts luck and equal parts knowledge and preparation, however, and Light describes this as well. Rose's entire quest as a seer of Light involves learning as much as possible, maintaining an awareness of the bigger picture, and finding the optimal route for her team to take to ensure victory. Rose also seems to enjoy psychoanalysis and attempts to give her friends therapy sessions, which could be seen as an attempt to help them illuminate things about themselves and help them to find their own fortunes. Her observations and planning are even essential to the troll session, since her game FAQs article proved essential in their preparation for entering the game. Rose also seems vaguely aware of her place in a story, and the crux of her character arc revolves around coming to terms with the fact that she has a character arc, or rather, doesn't. If that sounded confusing, it's because it is confusing, and I'm saving that discussion for later. I only mentioned it here to raise a question, which will raise several other questions which will segue us into another part of this video. How much does this meta-narrative stuff actually matter? Who is this narrator, and how much control does he actually exercise over the story? The follow-up questions that this raises are really the same question from different angles. Questions like, how much do ideas like fate and karma factor into outcomes that actually happen? 
Does luck actually matter? Do characters have free will? Do their choices actually matter? These questions are all fundamentally linked together by the light aspect, in the sense that light also describes the idea of agency. Records crash. Wait a minute, didn't I just get finished saying that breath describes agency? What kind of sophistic drivel am I trying to pull here? Well, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a reputable cataloging of all the types of drivel, but I would say that there's a subtle difference here. The distinction I would make is that breath describes freedom to take whatever course of action you want, while light describes the potential power that those actions can have on your present situation. Maybe a better word for this would be the idea of willpower. That's a sufficient distinction for me, but I won't try to argue that there isn't some fogginess or overlap here. So here's a question for the audience. Does that bother you? Does the idea that the aspects might have some redundancy with one another not sit well with you? If it doesn't, then that's great, and I agree with you. But if it does, that's also fine, since of course you're welcome to your own interpretation. But we're going to come back to this a little later, and if you hold off your judgment until then, you just might end up agreeing with me, and rather than being uncomfortable with this ambiguity, you might just end up liking it. The ultimate riddle is something which I believe heavily revolves around these ideas surrounding freedom, and because of that I'm going to put Rose's character arc specifically on hold until we get there. But, Rose isn't the only light player whose character arc heavily revolves around free will. Vriska, again as the Thief of Light, has the ability to mind control just about anybody she wants, effectively stealing their free will away from them and using it to her own benefit. A big part of Vriska's character arc is the struggle she goes through in reconciling her abilities with her feelings of self-worth. All of Vriska's abilities combined put her in a unique situation to steal relevance away from everybody else and easily become the most relevant, and yet using her abilities excessively for this purpose will leave her feeling unfulfilled like she didn't earn it for herself. Her struggles to find self-actualization through a balance between using and not using her powers forms a large part of who she is and how she defines herself, and this is also true of her ancestor, Orania. I haven't gotten into too much detail about how the class system works because I'm assuming that most people watching this have read Homestuck, but it bears mentioning now that the classes come in active and passive pairs. According to Callie, and as shouldn't be too surprising to us at this point, the active-passive distinction can mean many different things, but I believe it can be mostly boiled down to this. In most RPGs, characters on a team will fulfill different roles, all of which can be lumped into two categories. Either you're there to support the ones that are getting the shit done, or you're the ones getting shit done. And in another clever use of video game mechanics and storytelling, this distinction can apply outside of combat as well. Vriska plays an extremely active role in Homestuck in that her choices and personality are a major force that the plot has to pivot around. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have Vriska's ancestor, Arania. Arania is the Sylph of Light. Sylphs are essentially the white-slash-green mages of Homestuck. They seem to use their aspects in a casting role to heal or buff allies, so some educated guesses as to what her title might be are one who restores with light, or restores light, or one who improves with light, or just improves light. Arania's first major act in the story fulfills this title in the most literal way imaginable, by restoring eyesight to Terezi. In another obvious association with this title, she claims to have the ability to heal doomed timelines. While she may have been exaggerating how far that power went exactly, it's unlikely she was outright lying about it. Redirecting and extending the flow of the Alpha Timeline is a very similar act to manipulating luck when you think about it. Where Vriska forces the threads of possibility to take a specific direction, Arania is simply picking and choosing specific threads and extending their reach. As I implied though, the Sylph class is likely a very passive one on the scale, and where Arania might be able to heal offshoots, we see to disastrous results that she probably has no control over which threads the Alpha Timeline actually chooses to continue onto. It's also implied that Arania took a very passive role in her own session, and wasn't terribly important to how things turned out. I'd guess that this lack of relevance was primarily out of a fear of herself. Arania knew how easy it would be to get what she wanted by manipulating those around her, saw the dangers which came from doing that, and elected to never manipulate anyone as a result. She instead chose to limit her powers to reading minds, never invading quite enough to affect them directly, and she used the knowledge which came from that to act as a therapist to her allies in a manner similar to Rose. In doing this, Arania was healing them of their emotional struggles and unlocking their potentials so that they could amass fortunes of their own. Arania, being a circuit at heart though, had ambitions of her own, and serving this role led to a bottling up of repressed emotions. When confronted by the understanding of what she could have been in the afterlife, this bottled up longing for relevance manifested in a power grab so outlandish that it nearly broke the story. The last idea I wanted to bring up which likely corresponds to Light is that of Karma, which Google defines as a destiny following an effect from cause. Karma seems to be something that the Alpha Timeline factors into its progression, and it's something that Arania demonstrates a clear understanding of. It's through her that we're shown how the actions and events of her session had a karmic whiplash effect on who they ended up as as adults post-scratch, which had its own whiplash effect on the beta trolls which followed. 
Rose, frequently thinking of herself as a character in a story, tends to base her actions off what is appropriate given the events which preceded, such as her decision to be the one who would deliver the bomb to the Green Sun. She likely viewed putting out the brightest object in existence as an appropriate final rejection of the role she was assigned, which itself was something that she believed her character arc revolved around. She was bright, in a way, and this also reflects a certain understanding of how karma factors into future events. Friska, too, can be thought of someone who steals karma. When Vriska finds the journal belonging to Arania's post-scratch incarnation, she falls in love with the person depicted inside. She steals said persona and attempts to follow in her footsteps, believing their destinies to be linked together. Turns out, she was right too. There's plenty more to say about the two circuits, Rose, and the ideas of agency and free will, and rest assured we'll be returning to all of those things eventually. But I think at this point we've looked at the character arcs of Homestuck's three light players closely enough to get a good sense of what light is and the ideas that can be built out of it. Friska's title in particular is extremely clever, I think, since it can be interpreted very naturally in at least five different ways. She can be thought of as one who steals riches, luck, karma, free will, and relevance all simultaneously. At this point, though, you may be wondering if I have any evidence that the aspects describe more, shall we say, concrete objects. Things like apples, hammers, computers, and such. In truth, we won't find any direct evidence of this by continuing to do what we've been doing. Indirectly, though, it's clear that there are various concrete objects which symbolize their aspects. For example, note the obvious food association with the light aspect. All three of our life players use strife specify which are eating utensils, with Vifari and Mina both using forks and Jane using a spork. Mina, as the Troll Empress, masquerades on Earth as the owner and logo of a baked goods empire, producing much of the world's food, and with Jane as said empire's heiress, no less. Jane herself is ecstatic about baking. She uses a recipe-based inventory on top of her already food-themed strife specify, and as a sprite she acts as a healer by baking magic cookies and cake. With all that said, is it so much of a stretch to think that any sufficiently simple idea associated with food can be built at least mostly out of life? Or that objects associated with transportation and motion can be made out of breath? Or that objects associated with vision, lenses, wealth, and superstition could be associated with light? I don't think so, and without too much presumption on my part, I don't think that you think so either. Everyone watching this has probably already been thinking about the aspects as fundamental elements of some sort. Hell, the wiki page even says so in the second sentence. All I'm really doing here is making inferences from what we've seen in order to shed some of the vagueness. And if you look at all the more obvious ideas that we've seen represented so far, you'll see just how ingenious it was to use a video game class system like this. Find me another story with a magic system in which it's easier to represent the idea of plot relevance than it is to represent the idea of an apple, and I'll be pretty surprised. In the next video, we'll get to talking about the crafting system, and I think you may be surprised just how easy that is to connect with all of what we've been talking about. We'll of course be doing all this amidst applying the same type of character analysis that we've been doing to dissect several more of the aspects, and also begin to talk about the inverse pairs that they come in. Truth be told, we're just getting started here. In fact, I've been kind of thinking of this first video as just a long-winded introduction of sorts. Now that we've got this foundation laid out, I'm going to probably start putting shorter videos out much more quickly. In fact, I'm only about halfway through the script that I've written so far. The two aspects we've covered already were just the warm-up, so I hope you'll join me next time as we begin to tackle the more exotic ones. Please consider sharing this video around if you enjoyed it, and leaving a like and a subscription would make me feel warm and fuzzy inside. If you'd like to receive occasional updates on the status of my channel, you can consider following me on Twitter, where I promise to post a number of tweets that is strictly greater than zero every year. Thanks again for watching.